good evening. Welcome to another session of the online Bible study on the book of 1 Thessalonians. The focus of our study tonight will be 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 12 to verse 22. I pray that as we study, please turn your Bibles to that passage. Now, we entitled our series of studies starting tonight as How to Walk as Children of Light According to Our Apostle Paul. Now, before we expound our passage, let us first come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we can open your word and study it, rightly dividing the word of truth. I pray, Father God, tonight that as we look into your word, you would see the instructions of our apostle to us today in this dispensation that we may live pleasing to you as children of light. I pray, Father God, that as we look into your word, that your spirit guide us into all the truth. Help us to see the things you want us to see and the truths, Father, that we receive from your word this evening simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. One of the important keys of studying the Bible is to look at every passage in its dispensational and literary context. The truth is, that is actually commanded by our Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 that says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. To rightly divide the word of truth is to simply determine what the passage is for, that in the passage, who is talking, who is being talked to, and what is being talked about. Now, the truth that you don't need a doctorate or a master's degree to learn that. As a matter of fact, we do this kind of thinking and interpreting every day. And very much sure, you and I can do it. Now, this approach to biblical interpretation actually makes the scripture speak for itself. You don't need a commentary or a commentator to tell you the answer to these specific questions. You simply have to read it for yourselves from the scriptures. Now, the normal approach to these parts of the book of 1 Thessalonians, especially in chapter 5, as it's not commonly preached many times, but it has been focused on the more popular 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 to 18. Now, maybe you're wondering, what's in those verses? Now, maybe this would jog your memory. Those verses say, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, it's familiar, right? But to fail to see those verses in its entirety is to miss the Apostle Paul's main thrust and thought as he wrote this epistle to the Thessalonians and reduce the scriptures as simply quotable quotes thrown in by preachers and teachers who failed to study and rightly divide the word of truth. So what's the big picture here? Now our passage, that is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 to 22, actually connects way back, way back up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Now let's start our reading there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 1 says this, Furthermore, when we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. So, the first two questions is actually seen in that passage. Who is talking and who is being talked to? Who is this we beseech you and who is this you brethren? Now you don't need a commentary nor a commentator to see that. But if you turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse number 1, you would exactly see who is talking and who is being talked to. Now let's turn to that. 1 Thessalonians Chapter 1, verse number 1, reads this, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see who's talking? Paul, Silvanus, 
and Timotheus. Three, that gives the plural first person we in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. You see how easy to determine who is talking? Now, who is being talked to? We, we read in our passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians. So, that's the you brethren in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 1. And it's important to note that if you look or mark your Bibles in Acts 17, verses 1 to 4, the church of the Thessalonians is composed of both Jews and Gentiles. Now, maybe you're wondering, why is that important? Remember that the Apostle Paul's commission in Acts chapter 9, verse 15 is that God has chosen him to be a vessel to bear his name to Gentiles and kings and to the children of Israel, Jew and Gentile audience. Romans chapter 11, verse 13, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11 declares that the Apostle Paul is the Apostle to the Gentiles. Now, how important is that? Remember, my friends, we are Gentiles. Apostle Paul is our Apostle. Now, this makes him distinct and different from the 12 apostles that according to Matthew chapter 10, verse number 6, were sent only to the lost sheep of the children of Israel. Have you not wondered why the, apost uh, why the apostles, the 12 apostles, were commissioned by the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 28 and Acts chapter 1 verse 8 to go to the uttermost parts of the world? Yet the 12 apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Why? Because they were sent only to the lost sheep of the children of Israel. Now, a different spokesperson commissioned by God to a different audience actually marks a different dispensation and program. For this cause, only the Apostle Paul has the claim throughout scriptures of having his own gospel. Now, don't take my word for it. You can do a simple Bible search. Search for the phrase, my gospel. And see what it turns out. And you will see that it, it occurs three times in the scriptures. All of the occurrences are in the Pauline epistles and all are referring to Paul's gospel. Now this gospel is clearly the gospel that saves in this dispensation of grace. And this is plainly and clearly taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 to 4. Now hold your place in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 to 4. And if you're watching, read the passage carefully. Verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15 reads like this, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Now if anyone would say that this is not the gospel, they're not looking at the passage. It's in verse 1. The preach unto you, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I, that's the Apostle Paul, just check 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 1, which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Verse 2, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now maybe you're confused and thinking, is there only one gospel? It shows here that the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel that Paul preaches. Would this be the same gospel that is preached unto Abraham? I don't think so. Because Abraham wouldn't have had any idea who this Jesus Christ is and that he would die and was buried and rise again the third day. It would be an impossibility for them to think that way. Now, how about Moses? Did Moses look forward to the day of Jesus Christ? I don't think so, because Moses actually prophesied of the prophet, and if you'd read Deuteronomy, 
those who will not listen to the prophet pertaining to the Messiah would be cut off from the people. But nowhere in his mind is there a Jesus Christ who will die for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rise again. Now to make it very sure for you, even the disciples, when the Lord Jesus said that he will die and suffer and rise again, the disciples didn't know. Because they will have no idea this is not their gospel. But the Apostle Paul revealed this gospel. The death of Christ for our sins, his burial, and his resurrection for our justification. Now, having an exclusive gospel for him in this dispensation of grace makes the Apostle Paul the authority as the apostle to the Gentiles. That's why the Apostle Paul can also claim 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 2, and we would read, and this is very important, because Apostle Paul says, For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. That the Apostle Paul is our spokesperson for this dispensation of grace, having revealed to us the gospel that saves today, and according to to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 1, he teaches us now how we ought to walk and to please God. Hence, the series that we have both today and in the previous series is basically how to walk according to our Apostle Paul. Now, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 to chapter 5, verse 11, we have seen how the Apostle Paul instructed being our spokesperson how to walk pleasing to God, which is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 to 5, it's to know the will of God for us, which is our sanctification. In verses 6 to 8 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it is knowing the believer's calling of God unto holiness. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 19, we walk to please God in knowing his teaching about brotherly love. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12, it's walking and pleasing God, knowing His commandment to work that we may lack nothing. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, it is a walk of a believer to be pleasing to God even in our comfort, learning and knowing by the word of the Lord the rapture and the resurrection of those who died in Jesus Christ. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, we would see the believers walk in the light of the believers' preservation and deliverance from the judgment of the day of the Lord. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is actually the immediate context of our passage. Now, we would read from there, okay? So verses uh, 1 to 3 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says this, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now the phrase, day of the Lord, occurs 25 times in the scriptures. With the exception in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, and 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14, the phrase, day of the Lord, with the, with the statement, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, would always pertain dealing with the tribulation judgments that precede the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, always in the scriptures, the day of the Lord is depicted as a terrible day when the wrath of God shall be poured on this earth. Now, this is especially scary today in the light of the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine that may escalate unto a nuclear war. And it would not affect just those countries, nor Europe as a continent, but also the whole world. No wonder prophetic events and conferences abound today that cater to the restless souls who are writhing in fear but if we would read what the Apostle Paul has to say about the day of the Lord for believers in this dispensation of grace, we would know something. 
Now let's read verses 4 to 5 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. So what does it say? That's indeed a sigh of relief that our Apostle Paul says that we will not go through that day of judgment. But rather, being children of the light, we shall be delivered from this present evil world. As much as Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day, rise again. So the question is, if that day will not overtake us, how then should we live as children of light? Now that's our series, right? How to walk as children of light according to our Apostle Paul. Now we would see some general instructions in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6 to 8, where it reads, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us oh, who, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. So we see those general admonitions for the children of light, how we are to live. And we see in verse 9 to 10 that it's reiterated. It says, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 10, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Now, the deliverance from the impending day of the Lord goes back to the same foundational hope in which the rapture and the resurrection of those who died in Christ are founded. And that is the gospel message. Now do check back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and we would see there the foundational hope of the rapture and the resurrection. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses, verse 14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The rapture and the resurrection of those who died in Christ, it's founded on the hope of the gospel message. How about 1 Corinthians 15 that deals with the mystery that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Remember 1 Corinthians 15 it's verses 1 to 4 is actually the gospel message that the Apostle Paul preached that declares the death of Christ for our sins, burial, and resurrection. So you see, same foundational hope. And because the foundational hope of our rapture and deliverance from the impending day of the Lord is on the gospel message, we see in verse 11, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 11 says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Comfort and edify. Hence, we get the title for our series again, How to Walk as Children of Light, according to our Apostle Paul. The rapture, and the deliverance from the impending day of the Lord provides great comfort and edification. So we see the general admonitions in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6 to 8. Now verses 12 to 22 gives us specific admonitions from our Apostle Paul how we should live as children of light, having the hope of being delivered from this present evil world. Again, our study tonight will serve as an overview which we will look at specifically for the next five weeks. So let's start our study having an overview. Let's start reading verses 12 to 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And it says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake 
and be at peace among yourselves. Now, we would see in those verses, Paul's instructions to the children of light regarding their church leaders. Now, what would the believers recognize? Now, here are key terms. Apostle Paul says, Know them which labor among you, and them which are over you in the Lord. Now, those qualifications of those who do that in Thessalonica are actually, uh, actually pointing to elders, bishops, and pastors of the church. Now, note the word labor and turn your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 17 would show who labors and what is being labored. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 17 would say this. Okay? It says, Charged up, oh, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 says, Let the elders that rule well, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So you see, an elder labors in the word and doctrine. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 to 9, the Apostle Paul calls himself and a fellow minister, Apollos, as laborers in the Lord. Acts 20, 34, Apostle Paul testified that he labored with his hands. And Paul, Silas, and Timothy testified in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, that they also labored for the church. Labor. Now, how about overview? Overview, if you would turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 8, you would read these words. Acts chapter 20, verse number 8, and you would read also in verse 17 that this would be the Philippian elders. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28, says this. Apostle Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders, okay? It says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. You see, those who are over you in the Lord and labor seem to be pointing to pastors, bishops, and elders. Now, lest you think that those terms are a hierarchy, there's no such thing as a hierarchy when it comes to the church, the body of Christ. The bishop, the pastor, and the elder are actually synonyms in the scriptures. So, if this is pointing to the pastors, to the bishops, to the elders, would it be just them that the Thessalonians should esteem and highly, uh, highly esteem and know? Now, there seems to be something more than simply the pastors, the bishops, and the elders of the church. Because in, the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15 to 16, Apostle Paul used the word labor to those who help them, and it refers to the house of Stephanas. Hmm, sounds like it's different. Now, the third thing, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 12. The third thing, the third element there that we want to notice is the word admonish. Know them that labor who are over you in the Lord and admonish you, the Apostle Paul says. Now, that word admonish occurs three times in the Pauline epistles and in all of its occurrence, it is not simply a pastoral instruction but an instruction to all believers. For this reason, by virtue of the, by this, for this reason, the Apostle Paul actually, by virtue of the King James translators, did not, uh, who, by the King James translators who did not render this verse pertaining to the clergy as the Apostle Paul intended, but actually pertains to all in the church who labor for the church, who are over the church in the Lord, 
and those who admonish in the church. And for those who admonish, for those who labor, those who are over and admonish the church, the children of light are to regard them. It says to esteem them highly. And it says to esteem them highly in love for their work's sake. It's not a personality war. It's not a celebrity pastor complex. No, it must be that they are esteemed in the church in love for their work's sake. What's the result? The Apostle Paul says in verse 13, And be at peace among yourselves. When we recognize and regard those who labor, are over and admonish the church, peace is an inevitable result. On the other hand, when a church does not recognize and regard those who labor, are over and admonish them, then strife and divisions would occur. Want an example? That's what happened to the Corinthians. They re recognized and regarded some, but not all. So what happened? Let's see for ourselves. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 3, and let's see how the Apostle Paul dealt with it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting with verse number 3, it says, For ye are, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, one regards Paul, and another I am of Apollos, one regards Apollos. Are ye not carnal? How did the Apostle Paul deal with this? Paul says, Who then is Paul? Who then is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. That's your word again. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. The Apostle Paul is saying no divisions in the church, no regarding one minister to the other. All ministers are the same. The believers are to know them that labor, them that are over them in the Lord, and them that admonish. And they are to esteem them highly in love for their work's sake. Therefore, a believer should not prefer one leader in the church, but all who labor, all who are over them, and all who are admonishing them, resulting in peace. Now let's continue reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and let's turn to verse number 14 that says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. So we see here the instructions of the Apostle Paul to the children of light regarding their fellow believers in the church. And there are four things there. Number one, to warn them that are unruly. Now this unruly would refer as to what is written in Titus chapter 1 verse number 10 to the vain talkers and deceivers which are in the church. And I tell you the truth, there's so many people like that in the church today. Vain talkers, deceivers, they are unruly. So what do you do with those unruly in the church? Ironically, in today's churches, those who are unruly seem to be rebels and seem to be idolized by some. But the truth is, for those who are unruly, the Apostle Paul says, warn them. Now, in case you missed the point of what warning is, let me turn your attention to Titus chapter 1, verse 13. Remember, Titus chapter 1, verse number 10, showed us that the unruly are the vain talkers and deceivers. And Apostle Paul says, especially they of the circumcision. 
Now, Titus chapter 1 verse 13 would show us what warning is. And it says, This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Now, I want you to know that the goal of warning the unruly is not to push them away, is not to aggress them, is not to oppress them, but the main goal of warning the unruly is that they may be sound in the faith. Now, the second element, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 14, and we would see, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded. Now, the term feeble-minded only occurs in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 14, and it would refer, according to the context, those who are ignorant regarding the rapture and the resurrection of those who died in Christ, as well as the deliverance from the day of the Lord of the church, the body of Christ, which the Apostle Paul addressed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to chapter 5, verse 11. And he addressed it by giving the word of the Lord, revealing a mystery, which we can read also in 1 Corinthians 15, founded on the same foundational hope of the gospel that declares the death of Christ for our sins, burial, and resurrection. Comfort the feeble-minded. Those who are unaware that there will be a resurrection has to go back to the, to the gospel message that as Christ died and rose again, there will be a resurrection. And as Christ died, we are going to be delivered from this present evil world. Don't take my word for it. And if you want to turn to Galatians let me point to you an important passage that I believe would show us that by virtue of the gospel message, our hope is to be delivered from this present evil world. First, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse number 3 to 4 says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. That's the gospel message that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. You see, the gospel is the foundational hope that the believer will not go through the tribulation, will not see the second coming, but shall be raptured, but shall be resurrected at the rapture for those who died in Jesus Christ. As sure as Christ indeed died and rose again. That, my friends, is the believer's foundational hope. So, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 14. We are exhorted by our apostle to warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. Now, elsewhere, we would read in Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 3, that those who are strong ought to bear with the weakness of the weak and not to please ourselves. Galatians 6 chapter 1, uh, chapter 6 verse number 1 says that brethren if a man be overtaken in a fault ye which are spiritual restore such an one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest also thou be tempted. You see? Support the weak Comfort the feeble-minded and, and uh, to warn them that are unruly. And the number four, to be patient toward all men. Now, actually, there's a whole verse for pastors there. Let me turn your attention to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 to 26. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 26 says this. And it pays to write this down or mark this if you're a pastor and you're struggling with patience with all men, especially your own members, do write this down. The Word of God says this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 24 to 26, it says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patient, in meekness, instructing those who, that oppose themselves. What's the purpose? If God peradventure 
will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. We are to be patient with all men. This is how the children of light should deal with our fellow believers. That is according to our Apostle Paul. Now let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and let's read the last verses, 15 to 22, says this, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Now we would see here Paul's instructions to the children of light regarding their conduct as a church before all men. In verses 15, in verse 15, you would see what pertains to the believer and retaliation. It's almost unavoidable that evil be done to a believer. Now, maybe you're wondering about that, but that's actually normal. Did you know that since we are part of the body of Christ, the devil that hates the Lord Jesus Christ hates us as well? And as he attacks the word of God, and as he attacks Jesus Christ, he will attack believers wherever we are. So don't be surprised. Apostle Paul tells the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 that afflictions and tribulations shall come and that the believer should not be disheartened. The truth is, if you're a believer and you're not being going through tribulation or afflictions, now that's one thing that you should be wondering about, right? My friend, for the believer, tribulations and afflictions are normal. That's normal. Have you not noticed it? But my friends, if evil is done to the believer, Apostle Paul tells us, let none render evil for evil unto any man. Why? Because our concern and our desire is not to prove ourselves. Why? Because do you know that the believer's justification and acceptance is not reliant on man nor in what we do. We are justified by the faith and the finished work of Jesus Christ. So why need justify ourselves before men? If we are done evil of, then let none render evil for evil unto any man. But the Apostle Paul says in verse 15, Follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Do not retaliate. Next, verse 16 to 18 says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, this would pertain to the believer's attitudes. Rejoicing evermore. Why? Because our hope is not in this world. Our hope is to be delivered from this present evil world. Things will become much worse now. But we have this hope that we shall be delivered from this present evil world. And because we have that hope, we can rejoice. And while we wait for that deliverance, should we not pray that all men would have that same hope? Isn't that what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 2? Because remember, there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And if the man today would not listen to nor heed the gospel message how that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose again, that person cannot be saved. And that's a sad reality. Pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. For the believer, let's turn to Romans chapter 8, verse number 28, and we would see... A very comforting verse here. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And I think many of you memorized it. But I want to highlight a difference, how it's rendered in the King James Bible. It says, Romans chapter 8, verse number 28. 
says this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. You see there? And we know that all things work together for good. All things work together for good. Why? How, how can all things work together for good? And if you take this verse out of context, actually, good is a relative term. But do you know what's the good for those who are called according to His purpose, for those who are the called according to His purpose, for those who love God? The good is in verse 29 that says, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. See? We are being conformed to the image of His Son by all things that work together for good. So, in everything, give thanks. Now, verses 19 to 22, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, would pertain to the believer's reception of teaching. It says in verse 19, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings. Remember, the Spirit is in the Word of God, and when you despise the preaching and the prophesying of the Word of God, you are quenching the Spirit. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Now that verse is very important. For the believer, we have to search the Scriptures daily, whether these things are so. Do not shut your mind because of a certain preacher. Do not check about his language, his delivery, his methods, his techniques. No, that's actually Greek rhetoric. What you need to pay attention to is the message that they bring. Are they bringing to you the Word of God? Prove it from the Word of God. See for yourself. Search the Scriptures daily whether these things are so. But before you do that, you have to receive the Word with all readiness of mind. And search the scriptures daily whether these things are so. Prove all things. And verse 22, Approve all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now this would pertain to the believer and the reception of teaching. And we would see that our passage would simply say that the Apostle Paul instructs the believers to show a clear distinction being the children of light. And our prayer for you tonight is that you will see that our Apostle Paul teaches us how to walk as children of light. Now, these instructions are given by our Apostle Paul to those who are children of light. And the question is, how can one be a children, a child of light? Now, in this dispensation of grace, we can only be a child of light by hearing the gospel message preached by our Apostle Paul that declares the death of Christ for our sins was buried and on the third day rise again. The Apostle Paul shows who Jesus is being the Christ and what he has done. His death for our sins, his burial and resurrection, this is the finished work of Jesus Christ. And the finished work of Jesus Christ is actually a produce of the faith of Christ that justifies us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, we are justified not by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Hence, in this dispensation of grace, salvation is by grace. Why? Because it's by the faith and the finished work of Jesus Christ, and there's no works in our part. And no wonder our dispensation is called the dispensation of the grace of God and the gospel that is preached in this dispensation is called the gospel of the grace of God. Now, how, then, what, how then should one respond? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed, with that 
Holy Spirit of promise. My friends, the gospel message is clearly given. Hear the gospel and trust in Christ. And having trusted in Christ, our hope is to be delivered from this present evil world. Now, having that hope, we live in the way that the Apostle Paul instructs us as how the children of light are supposed to live. I pray that as you are hearing this, that you would indeed consider what we say and the Lord give you understanding in all things. Let me pray for you tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray that the truths of how we ought to walk as children of light, according to our Apostle Paul, would simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So thank you very much for listening. We hope to catch you again in our future broadcast on Saturday. We will have a Comfort Verses in Context broadcast. And on Monday, we hope that we can resume the precepts from the Proverbs. So thank you very much for listening. The Lord bless you.